God, again, we come before you this morning thanking you that you are a God who has revealed himself. You're a God who's made himself known, a God who is involved in our lives, involved with history. Lord, you're a God who loves us too much to leave us in our sin, but a God who calls us out of our sin. We thank you for that. We pray that you would do that for us here today. And Lord, as we look and see how you've acted in the past, help us, Father, to know that you are still the same and you are still active in our lives here today. We pray again, Lord, that you'd be with those who aren't here this morning, that you'd be drawing them closer to yourself. And again, Father, giving them a, a love for you and a love for, for growing in your word too. Uh, continue to reveal yourself. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at uh, the book of Amos again. And Amos is, um, trying to find it here, Amos is written before the fall of the northern kingdom here. So this is... Uh, uh, yeah, the kingdoms are divided at this time. You've got the northern kingdom, Israel. You've got the southern kingdom, Judah. And God is speaking to Israel here, saying there is judgment that is coming for you. So brace yourself for God's judgment. Uh, it's on its way. And t I guess the kind of message, you could summarize this message by saying turn or burn kind of a thing. And the people decide that, you know what, there really isn't anything we need to turn from. We're doing okay, so we're just going to keep on our our merry old way. Things are going well right now. Our country's prospering. Life is good. We have everything that we possibly need. Business is booming. Um, thanks, but no thanks. You guys and the prophets, can you can just go see yourselves out the door. Don't bother us here. So that's kind of the background of what's going on here. And we'll kind of pick up where we left off. Amos chapter 6 and starting at verse 8 here. I know we left off a little further, but this will get us uh, remembering where we were. The Lord God has sworn by himself... The Lord God of hosts has declared, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob and detest his citadels. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all it contains. And it will be if ten men are left in one house, they will die. Then one's uncle or his undertaker will lift him up to carry out his bones from the house. And he will say to the one who is in the innermost part of the house, Is anyone else with you? And that one will say, No one. And he will answer, Keep quiet, for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. For behold, the Lord is going to command that the great house be smashed to pieces and the small house to fragments. So here in, in verse 8, God is sworn by himself saying that he hates something about Jacob. What is this thing that is so detestable in God's sight that Jacob is clinging to? Their pride. Uh, can you think of any other Bible verses where God explains how he feels about pride? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pride goeth before the fall. Uh, I think in 1 Corinthians 10 talks a little bit about that. I don't know if that direct phrase is there, but it talks about uh, you that think you stand, take heed lest ye fall, something along those lines. Um, if you think you're, you're strong and mighty and you're good enough, you don't need any help, watch out because you're, <laughs> you're going to find out really quickly you're not as strong as you thought you were or you hoped you were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the opposite in the Beatitudes, blessed are the humble. Um, and I don't know if that's for they shall see God. I don't remember the second part of that part, but God is elevating the humble. Um, another passage, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so we see this over and over and over again. God does not like pride. He is opposed to pride. Why do you think God hates pride so much? Or what's at the very root of pride? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you're making yourself an idol. Uh, you, be you become God yourself. And what has God said about having other gods? It's the first commandment. You shall not have any other gods before me. Uh, I am the Lord, your God. I am your provider. I am your sustainer. This is who I am. This is what I do for you. So we can look at our lives and say, boy, look how good a job I've done with my life, and I have arrived here at this place. But then we take a step back and realize, but how dependent on God have we been throughout this whole process? And I told my... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And Nebuchadnezzar had been warned before. He had a dream and he was told, uh, oh king, I wish, this doesn't, I wish this was about your enemies and not you. But he dwelt on it for a year and then finally steps out of his palace and realizes, boy, look at the city that I have built. All these wonderful things I have done. And God says, watch this. And he loses his mind, goes nuts for a while. Um, and event, he's like a wild beast. Yeah. And eventually, God, he comes to his senses. God gives him the grace to come to his senses again. And he realizes, I have not built this myself. This is the work of God. And we praise God for that. Uh, it's much easier to learn that before having any kind of Nebuchadnezzar experiences. But throughout Scripture, God comes again and again. He opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You look at uh, even the Tower of Babel. Is what the people are trying to do. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let us build the tower all the way to the heavens and we can go and, and enter God's presence that way. And God says again, watch this. No, you're not. That's not the, how you access me. Um, confuses them and, and life continues on. But all this to say, God is opposed to, God opposes the proud and the arrogant um, consistently because we're finding our, our source of pride, our source of whatever else in ourselves or in something else rather than in God alone. It's, it's a fruit of idolatry, uh, to put it bluntly. So the, proud of, the pride of Jacob here, as we look at verse 8, they have citadels and recognizing they've got these fortresses, they're protected from any kind of harm that could come. Again, they've got uh, earthly wealth during this time, their prosperity, they have peace, they have protection, they have an army. No one can come against them and win. They are safe, or so they think. And yet they're rotting inside spiritually. And God is calling them again, saying, no, you don't understand how bad off this truly is, but I am going to let you see this for yourself. And he says in verses 9, uh, if 10 men are left in one house, they will die. In verse 10, people are going to be whispering quietly so that the Lord doesn't hear them, so that the Lord doesn't come and finish his judgment on them. Uh, verse 11, God says all the great houses are going to be smashed to bits and all the small houses too. Uh, there isn't any, anyone who's going to be spared from this judgment. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, the rich people are evil here in this. And the poor people are the noble poor people who um, God gives them a special pass. Now, this is moral decay across the spectrum. And so God's judgment is coming across the spectrum here. Then we get to verses 12 through 14. Do horses run on rocks? Or does one plow them with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You who rejoice in Lodabar... And say, have we not by our own strength taken Karnaim for ourselves? For behold, I am going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, God of hosts. And they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of the Arabah. So here in verse 12, a couple of questions are being asked. And these questions are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Rhetorical questions. But as these questions are being asked, there is an answer that is to be expected. What do you think that answer to be expected is? Do horses run on rocks? I don't know. I haven't been around horses much at all. But I don't see, and I don't really watch movies with a bunch of horses running around. But I would assume that they would run on pasture, on soft ground, or maybe, a, a, I don't know, not a rocky surface, unless you're talking like a gravel road or something like that. But the answer is, is no. Or here's one for farmers. Do you plow through a bunch of rocks with oxen? No, you pick the rocks. You don't just go plow through and say, oh, we're going to plant here anyway and see what happens. So you pick the rocks out of there. And so the answer here is, no, you don't do this. This is ridiculous. This is contrary to everything, uh, everything that should be expected. And he goes on in verse 12. You have turned justice into poison. Again, there is no justice that is here. Uh, the people at the time were uh, bribing. There's a lot of bribery that was going on, and it, there was no justice. No one was sticking up for, uh, for justice, I guess. The people who were bringing justice, they were being silenced by others. People said, shut your mouth. We don't want to hear it anymore. So you just go do your own thing. We're going to do our own way of life, and this is going to work. And the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. Again, this is the same, same thing, turning justice into poison. There is no justice here. Does God desire for justice to be done? 
Yeah. Does God care how we live our lives? Do people matter? People matter. And justice matters. God has called us to uh, a strict way of life, to be honest, um, to not be, a, not be charging exorbitant amounts of uh, price to, for different things that we have to offer. So if I have a monopoly on something, I can't say, well, Willis, give me all of your inheritance, and then maybe I'll let you uh, use my cowboy boots sometime for the next wedding you're in. We don't do that. I mean, God's given that we recognize that everything we have is a gift from God, and we give it back to the Lord. And so we share it with others as well. It doesn't mean we can't charge for things, um, but we're not using it. We don't view our possessions as simply a means to get more wealth for ourselves, which is what the people were doing here. Um, I don't remember if I'll... Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll get there, I think, in Amos chapter 8. Uh, so we'll keep on working our way through here. So this is what's going on. There is no justice here. Verse 13, you who rejoice in Lodabar, uh, a translation for that, or that word simply means a thing of nothing. So you who are rejoicing over nothing, is what he's saying here, and say, have we not by our own strength taken Karnaim for ourselves? Thinking again, our military is so strong, our military, our generals, our leaders are so great, no one can stand against us. Look, we even conquered this city here for ourselves. Look at how strong we are. This is what they're rejoicing over. Again, thinking, taking pride in their citadels, taking pride in their own security and protection that they have procured for themselves. And then verse 14 comes. And the Lord says to them, Behold, I am going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel. And who is saying this? The Lord God of hosts. And what is this army going to do? As he says in verse 14. What's that? Oppress them in every way. Is this something that you want to hear? No. But if you've got a strong enough army, no one's going to come and oppress you, right? That's what they thought. But this isn't just some other country coming and saying, uh, we're going to take you out. This is the Lord God of hosts who comes to his people and says, you've been finding comfort and security, and you're very proud and arrogant because of your military. I'm going to remove that from you. And instead, I'll raise up another nation who will come and afflict you, uh, and they will go ahead and do that. So the Lord will raise up a nation against them to afflict them. A wicked nation will be God's directed discipline for his people, calling his people yet again to himself. And the question comes, will they listen now? As destruction comes, will they be ready to turn and repent and listen and find safety and security in Christ or in God rather than in their own military strength? Which also brings another question here. How can God raise up, a question that probably people would have been asking, how can God raise up a nation against his people? How could God do this? It says, O oh, house of Israel, declares the Lord God of hosts, Israel is God's people, how can he raise up another nation against Israel? Uh, how? Yeah, okay, maybe why. Maybe. Mm hmm. Yeah, he allows that evil to happen, uh, but here it's saying, I will raise up this army against you. So he's not necessarily the one who's pulling the bowstrings and all of that, but God is the one who is raising up this army to bring punishment, his judgment, on his people. And a lot of times we think, uh, and I say we, I don't know if I'm pointing out to anyone individually here, just we collectively as Christians, we think that God exists simply to spare us from harm simply to give us a good life. 
simply to make sure that our lives don't have any suffering in them. We have this mindset inside of our head saying, God, you are God, I am, I am yours, why are you me to suffer? Why is this horrible circumstance happening to me in my life? And we have this question because we think that God only exists to give us, uh, to give us these good things. And I'm not saying that uh, God is sitting there with lightning bolts in his heart hand waiting for you to sin and just say, here comes the judgment, so watch out. Um, but we don't recognize that our sin brings judgment. We think God is just there to make us happy and to let us avoid suffering. What did Christ say about this life? In this life, you will have daisies and roses without any thorns. That's a poor translation. You look confused because you know that's not in there. No, in this life, you will have trouble. But take heart because I have overcome this world. There's suffering. There's tribulation. We live in a fallen world, and we experience that all the time. But what has God done to deliver us from that? He has sent his son to save us and to give us eternal life and to bring us home to be with him forever. So that's uh, a big picture scheme that we have to keep in our mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if God is love, and if I don't look to God's word to define or determine that love, then I will determine, define it however I want to. And this is who the God that I serve looks like or the God that I believe in. We have all kinds of caricatures for God rather than looking in Scripture and see, well, who has God revealed himself to be? It's not about what do I think of him or how do I think God is, but how has he revealed himself to be in Scripture? And so we have the same idea that the people in Israel were thinking back in the time. You see this in Jeremiah as well, saying uh, God says punishment is coming, and they say, oh, no, it's not. We've got the temple. We're God's people. Nothing's going to happen to us. Everything's going to be A-OK. -okay. So just go on your way. Everything's going to be fine and dandy. And they keep using God as a superstition rather than worshiping him as the one true living God, the God who has made them, and to be, made them to be his people and has also called them to live holy lives. And yet they reject all of that because, uh, for whatever reasons, they want to serve their own gods. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, which uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, saying, in the last days, men are going to not be listening to sound doctrine anymore. They want their ears tickled, and so they're going to listen to whatever it is that they want to listen to. They're going to listen to the things that make them feel good about themselves. Whether or not it's true, I feel good about myself, and that's becoming the determiner of truth, which is a very dangerous place to be because truth is black and white, and it's written down in God's word for us, um, and that's important for us to see. But we see here that God is, is bringing judgment upon his people. Again, why is he doing this or how can he do this? Because his people have sinned. His people have abandoned him. They've turned their back against the Lord. They have left that covenant that he has entered into with them. Um, and this is the judgment that they should have expected. It's been spoken of since Deuteronomy chapter 18, I think it is. Uh, but they've known, they've known the risks that they were taking ever since day one. But God is raising up another nation here to be uh, God's discipline for, for his people. So moving on to chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Thus the Lord God showed me, and behold, he was forming a locust swarm when the spring crop began to sprout. And behold, the spring crop was after the king's mowing. And it came about when it had finished eating the vegetation of the land that I said, Lord God, please pardon. How can Jacob stand for he is small? The Lord changed his mind about this. It shall not be, said the Lord. So verse 1, Amos is shown a vision of judgment here by the Lord. What is that vision that Amos sees? Locusts eating a crop, something that every farmer dreams about, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you wake up from that dream. Locust that's coming to eat a crop. Uh, we see this locust is coming. It's coming after the king's crop has already been uh, 
harvested in. So the king, he's fine. He's got everything that he needs. Uh, the first fruits go to the king. That's how that operated. And then you get, whatever. <coughs> farmers, you know this, first, first fruits, whatever of your field and flock, it go to the landlords, the renters, all of the debts and whatever else. And finally, if there's anything left over, that's your profit for the year. So you hope that there's a little bit left over after all your debts are paid. Same kind of thing here. Um, the first fruits go to the king. He gets his piece, and now the locusts are coming to wipe everything out. And it came about Amos as he sees this. How does Amos respond to uh, this vision? Yeah, um, Amos is saying, God, please, please don't. How can Jacob stand if this were to happen? How can this, <laughs> how could this be possible? Could God provide a way outside of this while still doing this? He could. Um, and again, this is, this is talking to the northern kingdom here. And the northern kingdom, historically, got wiped out entirely. It's gone, done away with. But there's that remnant in Judah, too. But as God is calling out to his people, he is calling them, warning them about this danger so that by faith they can remain his people. By faith they can still be his even if the locust comes and destroys all of their crops. Even if the Assyrians come and stick an arrow through them and they die, they can still be God's people by faith. And so this is, uh, as Amos is asking here, he's saying, God, please, uh, please don't do this. And he's interceding on behalf of Jacob. And how does the Lord respond to this intercession? He relented. Changed his mind and said, it shall not be. So here's a, a question. Were God's people deserving of this judgment? Absolutely, they were deserving of this judgment. How can God be just and let this slide? and relent of his punishment. For looking at this book, this book of Amos, and justice is a big, uh, a big theme throughout it. We just looked at verse 12, saying justice has been turned into poison by God's people. They're not upholding justice. They're not doing anything with that. They're, they're perverting justice. And now, doesn't it seem like God himself is also perverting justice if they deserve this punishment and he's holding back so he's, he knows the covenant so does that give people a free pass so how can God still be just and abide by this there will be punishment mm -hmm. the covenant doesn't trump punishment God doesn't say uh, because I like you this doesn't matter anymore. That punishment still needs to be doled out. So how can God be just and also relent from this punishment? These two things are at odds with each other. How can he be just and merciful at the same time? What's that? When Mm -hmm. It has to be corrected eventually. Absolutely. And God here is saying, I love you. This is why I'm warning you about this. Uh, this is the cost of your disobedience, of your rebellion. This cost needs to be paid. And Amos, he sees this vision of the locust coming, 
and he's saying, this is how it's going to be paid out. You're going to pay up. And Amos says, God, please don't. And God says, okay, fine. I won't. But again, how can God be just and loving and still let that slide? There's a... <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how do we know that? The Bible tells us that. The penalty for sin is death. And so each one of these people deserved to die. Each one of them deserved to die. They deserved to starve. They deserve, deserved to die a miserable death for their rebellion against God. And it's good for us to also notice that of ourselves. For each one of us who has sinned, which is every one of us, we deserve to die. We deserve to die a horrible, miserable uh, death full of anguish, not just some simple passing in your sleep. This is what we deserve, an eternal punishment for our sin. Do we get that? The reason why God is able to say, I'm not going to send the locust is because he has already known from the beginning of time that he is going to send his son to pay for the sins of these rebellious, arrogant, proud, uh, fill in any other name for these Israelites here who are not going to submit to him. He has already paid for their sin in Christ Jesus. The reason why you and I get to take another breath and we get to look forward to eternal life is because Christ has already paid our debts as well. All of God's judgment, all of God's wrath has been poured out on Christ Jesus. He drank the cup of God's wrath in its entirety down to the very last bit. This is what Christ's taking on our sin means for us. And Romans says in Romans chapter 3, 26, I think, um, talking about in Romans 3, 23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, or for the wages of sin is death. I think 6, 23 missed that up. The wages of sin is death. Uh, and also says, um, I just might as well look it up. It's a better way about going about it. It's a good enough passage. I should have it down. It says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. We can see this is what God is doing here with this whole locust swarm as well, passing over the sins that have previously been committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So how could God, quote unquote, let this slide? He's not letting it slide but Christ is paying that in its fullness, in its entirety for these people. Do they deserve it? Absolutely not, by no means. Do we deserve it? Absolutely not, by no means. But God, because of his love for us, gave us his son so that we might have eternal life in him. So that's why God can be just and merciful at the same time because of what he has done for us in Christ Jesus. So moving on to verse 4. Another vision is given to Amos. What does Amos see here? What kind of judgment does uh, Amos get a glimpse of here? Fire. Uh, all the farmland is going to be consumed by fire. And how does Amos respond? Lord God, please stop. How can Jacob stand because he is small? Again, he's no longer pointing to the pride and the arrogance and saying, oh, it's okay, we've got it all figured out. We can handle this. Uh, <laughs> hashtag Israel strong or hashtag Deschler strong, or whatever kind of thing, different things that happen. There's, I don't know when those things first started, but uh, you just dig down, dig deep into your own identity as a local community and say, we're a small community, we got this. It's not what they're saying here. 
he recognizes, God, this is beyond us. We don't stand a chance if we're here to receive your judgment. Oh, Lord, please stop. And how does God respond? He relents of his judgment yet again. Amos is interceding on behalf of these people. Even though he knows that they are wicked, even though he knows that they are deserving of God's judgment, Amos is still interceding on behalf of God's mercy. Then we come to another vision here. In verse 7, Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. <clears throat> the Lord said to me, What do you see, Amos? And I said, A plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I'm about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be desolated, and the sanctuaries of Israel laid waste. Then I will raise up, rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So here, verse 7, another vision is given to Amos, and he sees a plumb line. What is a plumb line? It's a straight line. Why is, a, why is it, what do you use a plumb line for? Art class? What if it looks mostly good? It has to be square. Mm -hmm. You're going to build, if you're, if you're going to take the time to build something, hopefully you're taking the time to build it so that it lasts, so that things are square, so that things are plumb. I don't know if anyone has uh, experienced or found that out the hard way or not. We're, our eyeballs can be pretty good, some better than others, but it's important that things are plumb for structural integrity here. God says, I'm going to bring out a plumb line. What do you think God's plumb line is? So you're trying to see if the walls of uh, Israel are straight enough? Right or wrong? Black and white. There it is right here. Uh, this is God's plumb line. And as he holds up this plumb line to the people of Israel, how do they measure out? They're kind of leaning over a little bit, a lot of bit, about to fall over. They are not plumb. And so this is what God is saying here. What do you see? I see a plumb line. The Lord said, Behold, I'm about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will spare them no longer. They're going to be judged. And again, God isn't going to uh, just give them a free pass here, but he recognizes, look, this is the standard. You've broken the standard. Judgment is coming for you. And he says, The high places of Isaac will be desolated. The sanctuaries of Israel laid waste. And then I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Uh, Jeroboam was the first king of Israel, and Jeroboam was pretty quick to establish worship in the northern kingdom. You remember where the, uh, I'll ask this question, trivia question for 500 points. Where was the temple located? Uh, not of Jeroboam, just the, the Israelite temple. The big, the big place of worship that Solomon had set up. In Jerusalem, when the country split, there's a northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, which side got Jerusalem? Which side got the place of worship? The southern kingdom, Judah. So Judah has the temple. Judah has the place of worship. Now these people are split. They're both saying, I'm God's people. I'm God's people. God says, worship me here, but that's no longer my territory, so I'm going to set up another place here and I'm going to craft this fancy little calf out of gold and say, this is the Lord God, worship him. This is where we, northern kingdom Israel, do our worship. And so that's what they did. This is the very first king of Israel. One of the very first things that he does is establishes worship outside, apart from God, is what he does. Bringing in syncretism, saying, this golden calf is the Lord God, worship this calf. We don't need to worry about the temple anymore. We don't need to worry about those restrictions uh, or how God has revealed himself to be worshipped. We're going to do things our own way. And so since the very beginning of Israel's history, this has been all throughout their, uh, their history. And so God says in verse 9, those high places, I'm going to demolish them. Those places of worship where you have gone to sacrifice and to worship uh, whatever deity you claim to worship, whether you're saying you're worshiping me or some other pagan gods, I'm going to bring destroy all of those. And the sanctuaries of Israel too. 
Those aren't the places where I've said to worship me at. You're building these things apart from me. And then I'll rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. For whatever reason, God in his patience, God in his mercy, had permitted, the, had permitted Jeroboam to craft this idol and had permitted the Israelites to continue uh, in their way. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet to call them out of their idolatry, to call them back to himself, but it still stayed there. Kings came, well, I guess no kings from Israel came. Uh, in the southern kingdom, kings came and obliterated all of the idols and different things like that. In the northern kingdom, that happened all throughout their history, um, that they were worshiping these other gods. But God says here, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to reestablish worship. I'm going to get rid of uh, that sin of Jeroboam that came. Then we get to verse, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is unable to endure all his words. For thus Amos says, Jeroboam will die by the sword of Israel, will certainly, and Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. So verse 10, the high priest, the person who is supposed to be leading God's people into worship of Yahweh, the high priest in the land at Bethel, hears Amos' message, and he runs and he tells the king, O king, there is a coup in place against you. And who does he attribute this coup to? Amos. O king, Amos is out to get you. You better do something about that guy. Are these Amos' words? In verses 7 through 9, in verse 9, Amos is simply receiving this message from God, and he is God's spokesperson here, proclaiming what God has said. Rather than uh, dealing with Amos and punishing Amos, what the king should have done is looked and said, this is the word of the Lord coming against me. What do I need to do? Uh, first of all, is it true? Is what, the Lord's, is what the word of the Lord said true? Yes, it is. And what do I, does this mean for me? You can look back at Amos and realize, ever since day one, what does it mean for me? Repent and believe in the Lord God. Turn from your idols and your wicked ways and establish justice in the land again. So that's what's happening. Uh, Amaziah is going to tell on Amos. And verse 12, that Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee away to the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and there do your prophesying. So he's saying, get out of here. We don't want you anymore. No more speaking against the king. And I am being kind to you right now by saying, you can go to Judah, and you can live and do your ministry there, but you're not welcome here anymore. He basically says, go back to where you came from. We're done with your message. We don't need you here any longer. Uh, put yourself in Amos's shoes for a bit here. This is what you're trying to do. You're simply being a mouthpiece for the Lord, simply saying what God has said, simply trying to warn people, calling out sin for what it is, calling people back to repentance and faith in God. And that this is how the world treats you. How do you handle that? Keep on keeping on. Uh, there are a couple, yeah, there are a couple of, <laughs> uh, they're not paying me enough to do this. Yeah, exactly. God, I just wanted to be that almond farmer. Just let me go back to my fields. I've, I'm not even a, uh, a prophet anyways. I didn't ever want this path of life. Why am I here? He could have reacted that way. Um, I don't think we see his, his reaction here. But this is what happens when we stand on God's word, when we become um, resolved to do what God has said and unwavering on what God has said. We can, and it brings, uh, it brings tension with those around us. We can either say, oh, I don't like this tension, and so something needs to budge. Either it means that I budge in my resolve to uphold God's word, or I start twisting God's word, or else it means that this problem that I'm trying to bring out needs to be addressed and dealt with. These are the only two options that we have for bringing resolution. As we look at this passage in Amos, what was the resolution that the people took? Amos, get out of here. 
We don't want to hear it anymore. Everything is fine. We don't need this. We're going to ignore this problem. And that doesn't solve anything. Instead, they recognize it. Uh, Amos calls it out. Well, the Lord come, sent, the Lord points it out through Amos here. And Amos is uh, kind of chastised from it. Verse 13, but no longer prophesy at Bethel, for it is a sanctuary of the king and a royal residence. How dare you speak these things to the king in his presence, because this is a sanctuary. This is his safe place. This is where he goes to meet with the Lord, and you don't have any say in what the Lord says to him. Who are you? Go back to where you came from. Delivering God's message at times puts you at odds with people, because nobody wants to be told you're a sinner. We all want to be told, we're doing a good job, everything is fine, you just keep being you and everything's going to be all right. Whether that is calling out sin in authority figures who are abusing their authority, whether it's calling out sin for public, uh, the public opinion that has neglected and discarded God's word, where it's no longer uh, politically correct to speak what God's word declares, delivering God's message is going to leave you a marked person. However, God does not bend the rules. That plumb line is straight. Regardless of how you feel about it, regardless of how culture wants to interpret it, God's standard is still God's standard. We don't get to bend it. Um, and so we must remain faithful to his word. Even when authority, culture, and our own reasoning tries to sway us away, and even our own personal comfort as well. It's a lot more comfortable to do things in our own way than to do things what God has said. It's a lot more comfortable to ignore sin rather than to call it out. It's a lot more comfortable to just do what we want to do rather than say, this is what God's word says. This is a problem. This needs to be addressed. But they, this is what God has called us to do. In verses 14 through 15, Amos uh, delivers a defense for why he is here. Then Amos replied to Amaziah, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet. For I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Amos replies to Amaziah saying, Look, I didn't want to be here anyways. I just wanted to tend my flock, to tend my figs. That's all I wanted to do. But the Lord has brought me here, and he has given me a message, and I have no other choice but to deliver his message. And so this is what Amos is doing. And then he has some final words for Amaziah. Now hear the word of the Lord. You are saying, you shall not prophesy against Israel, nor shall you speak against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife will become a harlot in the city. Your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be parceled up by a measuring line, and you yourself will die upon unclean soil. Moreover, Israel will certainly go from its land into exile." Here's some final words of the Lord for Amaziah. What is Amos' message here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what you say, Amaziah. It doesn't matter where I go. This is what's going to happen. This is the word of the Lord. Um, you, you can avoid that by repenting and turning from your wicked ways, or you can seal your own fate, so to speak, by sending me away and turning your ears off to the message that the Lord has come to give to you. I'm okay with just raising my figs, uh, but here I am. This is the message of the Lord for you. Mm -hmm. And here's a, another thing, too, that is good for us to wrestle with. The, uh, how do you want to say this? 
the aspect of self-preservation that comes into play here. Because Jeroboam is, he's a done man. The word of the Lord has come against Jeroboam saying, Jeroboam, you're going to die. You're going to die because this is the Lord's judgment against you. So he's, he's done. And also Israel is going to be taken off into uh, captivity. So these things too are, are what God is saying is going to happen. And so how are the people going to respond? Are they going to say, no, that's never going to happen, not to my king, not to my people, not to my country. This will never happen. We're going to raise up more military. We're going to build up the walls a little bit bigger, all these different things. So are we going to preserve ourselves or are we going to humble ourselves? Which goes back again to this pride of Jacob. Is Jacob going to find their safety and their security in the Lord? Or are they going to find their safety and security in their prosperity, in their walls, in their military, in all of these different things, in their own religion? Or is it going to be in the Lord? Yeah, and how often does self-preservation come into play when our sins are being called out? I don't, I don't want to be shown that I'm a sinner. I don't want to be told that I'm not enough or that I'm not good enough. I don't want to be told that I'm doing something wrong. I want to be told, you're doing a good job, pat me on the back and send me on my way, kind of a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't work, don't have to get a job, don't have to work. Everything is scary. Yeah, I'm glad we have a government that cares about me and my needs and my <laughs> eternal salvation, all that good stuff. I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but as we as we think of um, sure, we'll we'll add, end on this note. As we think of our own country as well, how much does our own national self-preservation come into play when if God is, through his word, is calling us to do something else, yet we say, ah, no, Lord, I don't want that because I think this is better for our country. And this will be, this will ensure that our country sticks around a little bit longer. And our patriotism trumps serving God and obeying his word and submitting to his word or whatever it might be, all these different things, all these idols that come up inside of us. Uh, we can look at the Israelites and say, shame on you for being uh, full of idols and all this stuff. But when we turn that mirror into ourselves and we look and see all the idols that we have, all of the uh, self-preservation instincts that we have as well, and all of the, the trust and security that we find in things outside of the Lord, uh, we're no better. And it's good for us to hear these words of Amos and to see the Lord calling us back to himself as well. Uh, with that, we'll close with prayer today. Father God, we thank you for your word and for its truth. Uh, we do thank you for the privilege of being in this country where we are able to open up your word together and to study it and to, to not have to worry about being persecuted for that. God, we, we pray that we wouldn't take these, these rights and these privileges uh, for granted but that we would be about doing that, Lord. We would be about studying your word and growing in your word together. As a congregation, as individuals, Lord, we pray that you would be with us as well when the time comes for people to call us out for our sin. God, we pray that you would take away our pride, take away our, our self-preservation. Lord, keep us humble. Humble us before you, where we can uh, honestly ad admit our sins, our failures, and confess those sins, and to find grace and forgiveness in you. Jesus, we thank you for being uh, willing to leave the comforts of heaven, to come into this world, and to obey your Father perfectly on our behalf so that God could be both just and the justifier of those who have faith in you. And so, Jesus, we thank you for that here this morning. We pray that you'd help us to live in that truth each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.